All right. Um, while we do a quick, quick reshuffle here, um, our next speaker. Um, Graham, I just need to to bring up your new. Um, and you can you can start by introducing yourself, and, and then I'll get your get your slide. Hi, I'm Graham. Hi, Graham. Um, yeah. So those of you who've been to a few of these might know that I normally come wearing multiple hats. So my name tag says SA Digital Villages. That's my day job. Um, today I'm going to be talking from the perspective of ISPA, the Internet Service Providers Association. So. As soon as Donald finds my presentation, then we can get started. I'm the last speaker before our break, so I'll try and keep it quick and I also want to leave a bit of a gap at the end for everybody to ask any questions you might have. Um, so, okay. There you go, cool, alright. Thanks very much, Donald. So, yes, Internet Service Providers Association. Um, the registration number there is only 2016. That's because we changed our organizational structure, which I'll explain in a moment. So, okay, it's like just lagging a bit. So, ISPA was founded in 1996. Um, before many of us here were actually involved in the industry, I think. I think there might be a few of us here, but many of us weren't involved in the industry back then. Um, my nice piece down the side there, only one of those names still exists. Um, and many of those names I've never heard of, so if you can spot more than... There you go. Okay, so some historical people on the internet here. <laughs> There was a need recognized that we had between the ISPs at the time to find a body that could deal with issues of, in, of ish, interest to the ISPs in South Africa. Um, because at the time, Telcom was still the, the monopoly provider and there was many people at Telcom who were convinced that they were going to be the only people to ever provide internet in South Africa. Along the way, we've done a bunch of other things. So in 2008, 2009, we were recognized by the Minister of Telecommunications as an industry representative body. Um, I'll explain a little bit later what that's all about. And then in 2016, we changed from a voluntary association to a non-profit company. So that was just a legal thing, but that means we now have a board, we have audits, we have financial reports, all of that other admin, which we get to deal with, but it means that we are fully recognized and we found that particularly internationally, the concept of an association or a voluntary association, these, these are legal frameworks that are specific to South Africa and many international organizations wanted to see a company registration certificate on a government letterhead and that got us there. That's a couple of our large members. Some of them have changed logos and stuff since then and merged. And, but that's a, that's a general idea of some of the larger ESPA members that we've got at the moment. I'm not going to talk too much about the internet exchanges because I know that there's presentations about those later. But in 96, Johannesburg Internet Exchange was also formed as a project of ESPA. Um, it was the first exchange point on the African continent and it continues to run today. Also, the exchange is in Cape Town and Durban, um, hosting for many years things like DNS and other critical internet resources, um, increasing the resilience. At the time when the exchange points were started, we had a lot of very thin parts to the international internet. 
and those pipes went down often and we became isolated and the, ex the exchanges were a mechanism to make sure that we could continue to communicate within the country even when things outside of the country failed. All of the exchanges are now multi-sites as you're probably aware. So two sites in Durban, three in Cape Town and four locations, four data centers in Johannesburg. So the industry representative body portion is specific around the ECT Act, there's a specific section in the ECT Act where ISPs who participate in an industry recognized re industry representative body have reduced liability about the traffic on their networks and the content that are posted on their servers. So this is a very important legal protection that's in South African law. At this stage, ISPA is the only industry re representative body that ha has that recognition. And so there are a number of ISPs who join for that purpose specifically. Um, part of the, what goes along with that IRB recognition is the concept of a takedown notice. The takedown notice is a process that allows people to serve notice on an ISP to get illegal content removed from their networks. I'll go into more detail about that further down. And then ISP has been involved in regulatory activity over the years, lots of different acts there, blah, blah, blah. Um, getting involved with some of the national governmental policies and, and all the rest of it around telecommunications and ICT and that sort of thing. And then coming to the purpose of what I'm going to be talking about today is this last one at the bottom, cyber crimes and cyber security. So cyber crime and cyber security globally is, is a hot topic and South African politicians are jumping on the bandwagon, so to speak. So criminal activity has always been there on the internet, it's always been kind of background noise for us, but over the last few years it's become increasingly prevalent with people getting access to the internet who are the common man on the street, we now have an increased migration of criminal activity onto the internet. Now that's not to say that the criminal activity is caused by the internet, which I think is what some people think. It's just the fact that people use the internet as a platform to do everything, to communicate, to interact with their peers, to do all of this sort of thing. And the natural extension of this is people are going to use the internet to commit crimes. So we see a lot of crimes now, in fact almost all crimes involve some element of communication and coordination between criminal elements that runs over the internet and runs over our infrastructure. Sometimes that's because our direct customers are actually criminals. Sometimes that's because people defraud our companies to buy internet from us illegally and use it for nefarious purposes. And some, sometimes it's just because our customers are not careful enough to not let criminals onto their networks. A coffee shop gives away free Wi-Fi and next thing they're running a Nigerian smuggling ring out of the back of their coffee shop. Unintentionally, but the reality is that this is happening on networks. So how many of you in the room have received a subpoena from the South African Police Services? <coughs> You're lucky. Because anybody who runs a fairly large ISP is likely to get one of those at some point in the, in the next few years. Increasingly the SAPs are getting capabilities and understanding of how the internet works, how it plays into the cr criminal activity that they're investigating and where they have the information, they are coming to ISPs looking for contact details, details of the ID number that registered the service, details of the address that was registered, who has allocated an IP address at a particular time, and this is happening regularly now. The other legal bodies in, our, in South Africa, including SARS, have also realized that their investigations now involve people who are running things on the internet. SARS has the tax e-filing online, so when people are defrauding e-filing, then there's an IP address that they can look at, and what do you know? They come and knock at your door wanting to know who is using this IP address, why were they doing it, and 
piece can you get five the Hyman Grace? I think I'd break down a door. We also have obviously the social aspects, the social crimes that are taking place in South Africa. Um, we've seen the, the, the issues of hate speech and cyberbullying and these sort of things. Many of these do take place on global social networks that we don't have direct control over. And those global entities have their own processes in place to deal with those kinds of incidents. But there is also, in parallel, a certain number of people who have really nefarious intentions who know that if they do something on Facebook or on Twitter or on whatever, that they're going to get nailed. And so they'll go and buy a 50 rand a month virtual private server to host a forum that's got extremely inappropriate content. Or they will use some private server to host pornography that's of children. Or there, there are many things that have been taking place in South Africa, unfortunately, and this is on the increase at the moment and we need to deal with it. Obviously, as I alluded to before, financial fraud, scams, um, stolen credit cards, all of that kind of thing. Copyright infringements I mentioned there, and when I refer to copyright infringements there, I know that there's a lot of noise always about copyright infringements of video and media content from international organizations. Most of you, if you run an IP network, have probably, probably got a notification from one of the international legal organizations serving you notice of intention to blah, blah, blah. And most of those are not legally binding in South Africa because they're from a different legal jurisdiction. But the reality is, is that things are happening inside South Africa with South African content being stolen by South Africans and reused and redistributed by the South Africans. And people are looking for ways to address that online. So the takedown notice is, as of today, probably the most effective mechanism we have to deal with these issues. And lawyers, banks, um, the police services, all of these entities are now becoming aware of this and they're using this facility regularly when they find out that there's content online that infringes some legal rights or is criminal or whatever, they are submitting takedown notices in high volumes to ESPA. We distribute them to the ESPA members and the content that is illegal gets removed off the internet and stops being available to view online. Unfortunately, this doesn't solve the problem of prosecuting those people, but at least the content becomes unavailable and in most cases fairly quickly. So, at the political level, the, the, the solution to this is creating more laws. And so, the Cybercrime and Cybersecurity Bill, which is now being chopped up and is now just the Cybercrime Bill, has been rattling around Parliament and it had been discussed and debated for probably around three years now. Um, it was looking like it was almost finished and then everybody packed up their bags and left Parliament and went to go and canvass for elections. So it hasn't been finished and it will probably only get finished after the new government is elected in our May elections. But the purpose of this, this bill, which will become an act, is to bring in South Africa in line with international trends in terms of cybercrime law. Um, there's significant parts of it that relate to the policing, the collecting of evidence, and the mechanisms of prosecuting people who are doing bad stuff online. There's been a lot of stuff that everybody's known as being bad, but there's been no legal framework that says, when you do this thing that we all know is bad, you go to jail for this amount of time. And so this new cybercrime bill details a lot of that quite clearly, and most of it is fairly rational and helps us deal with the, the, the criminal elements that we have in South Africa. Yeah, so next session of Parliament will start in June, I think, so towards the end of August. We're expecting that this will be signed off by Parliament and we'll wander over to whoever our new president is or existing president coming back, whatever it might be, for him to sign off into law.
There's also been a bit of alarmism about the cybercrime bill, so I don't know if anybody saw some media reports saying ISPs will be required to report the pirates on their network, otherwise you'll end up in jail for 15 years. And yeah, if you kind of cherry pick a couple of lines from various different parts of the bill and read them all out of context, you can kind of get to that conclusion, but that's not either the intent or the letter of the law as it currently stands. There are portions of the law that require ISPs to report criminal activity should you become aware of it. Um, and these, these are obviously there to deal with extreme crimes that you would in any context need to report anyway. But it's just extending that into a cyber context. This is very different from monitoring or intercepting what your customers are doing, analyzing their traffic, and then trying to make a judgment about whether your customer's stream of TCP packets is pirated content or not. It's also important to note that if you are analyzing your customer's packets beyond the technical details in them, you're probably in violation of RICO because it is illegal in South Africa to analyze traffic if you don't have an interception warrant issued by a suitable judge. But as I say, high priority crimes are allowed for in the Act. There are going to be requirements that you have an obligation to report certain crimes, but it's highly unlikely that there will ever be a, a regulation issued relating to copyright infringement, these are going to be for far more serious issues. So ISPA's activities, besides keeping track of the, the evolution of these acts and contributing to the discussion and <coughs> getting involved in the formulation of these laws, ISPA's also internally been, had a cyber security or a security working group for a number of years. Um, we do an annual test of ISPs and their responses to their abuse mails. And our most recent test, we had over 30 ISPs were able to give a human response to an abuse mail within 300 seconds. Now, I think that's very impressive. And there is always a little bit of a competition to see who can get to the top of that list. I think the top of the list on that one was seven seconds response time. You can write seven seconds. <laughs> but this is important. That's just good automation. <laughs> it could be. It, yeah, there, there are ways you could automate it, but, but the, the mails have changed in structure and it's a bit, yeah, you, you could possibly automate it. Anyway, the, the point is that, the point is that responding to abuse issues on your network, unfortunately there is a big volume of noise involved in that because we've got, like we said, the copyright notices coming from overseas and that kind of thing. But at the moment, an abuse mailbox is the most effective way for people to communicate with your network about something going bad in your network. And if you don't have an idea of how that's been handled, or what you're doing about that, you need to go back and look. Because law enforcement, the police services, their first place that they start when they're trying to find out who owns an IP address is to look up in the news for the abuse information. And very often that, that first subpoena will be a scan to PDF of a handwritten note signed by a judge, blah, 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 which will go to an abuse address. And if you're not paying attention to those and dealing with them, it could be that the director who happens to have his name in the Afrinic database then has a policeman knocking at his door the next day. On a more practical side, it's, not also, it's also not just about the police. It's about us as a network community being able to interact with each other and reach out when we see stuff happening. If there's a denial of service attack originating from someone else's network and causing an outage on one of our bits of infrastructure, we need to be able to reach out, we need to be able to communicate and collaborate to resolve these issues. So, as a security working group, we've been going forward and doing other activities in line with the cybersecurity developments in the country. 
Um, we're, the cybercrime legislation is pending, so we're obviously keeping an eye on that and seeing where we have to fit in with that. And one of the areas that's been a hot topic for the politicians has been the issue of the cybersecurity response team, a CERT. And then lastly, ISPA's active in consumer education around online safety. So these next few slides are taken directly from a friend of mine's presentation in Parliament to the Portfolio Committee. And this is a ranking of countries in terms of cyber security readiness. And South Africa is not that great down the bottom there. And this was presented to politicians, and this looks bad, and the politicians are worried. So they've created that. And there's a whole bunch of things with the, the military and state security and the police and all the rest of it. And then in the corner there, we've got sector C certs which is basically everybody else in the country. And so it's a small bit of this diagram, but moving over to this diagram, it's a slightly bigger bit. So we have the Cybersecurity Hub, which is the interface between government and private sector on issues of cybersecurity. And the Cybersecurity Hub, based in the CSR in Pretoria, is currently looking to each industry sector to establish some kind of function to deal with cybersecurity incidents. So as you can see in the middle here, this is the finance sector. Finance sector is right on top of this because they know it affects them financially significantly. Financial fraud, attacks against banking systems, all of these things have a re very real impact. And at the moment, SABRIC and the other financial associations are probably at the forefront of cybersecurity activities. Then off on the side there we've got the ESPA C cert which although we consider ourselves to be a long way off from operationalizing this, we are still ahead of every other industry sector and still get a, get a mention when presented to Parliament. So I think we still have a long way to go but we're already at least ahead of the game here and we need to carry on pushing forward because the national policy on cybersecurity issues is one that gives it a very high priority. And if we don't get together and get ourselves organized with our own c cert functions, there is a chance that regulations and legislation could come out where we will be dictated to on what we will have to do and what we won't have to do. And we prefer to not get to that point. We prefer to be ready, to be self-sufficient, and to be handling all of this stuff ourselves before we get to the point of rules being imposed on us. So, ISPA has started with CSERT.net.za representing the ISP industry. Um, got the mission statement there that's part of a, a whole founding document. Because we're not quite at the point of operationalizing it, we haven't published this online, but the information is there, the planning is in process. And the intention is that this will be open to both ISPA members and non-members. So although it's being driven by ISPA, we realize that it's an important thing for the entire industry to participate in and to exclude non-ISPA members because of their, whatever their reasons are for not joining ISPA from something as, as important as this is not a good idea. So we have made it open to everybody. The functions of the CSERT are to coordinate between ISPs, information sharing, dealing with incidents, sending out alerts when stuff is happening so that the ISPs can, can be aware of stuff that's happening that might impact them. And at the bottom there, to help ISPs build the internal capacity to deal with these issues themselves. So as I said, an abuse desk or an abuse mailbox, a person reading an abuse, abuse mailbox, these are important things in the first step of dealing with this issue. Some of the large ISPs have entire departments devoted to this of five or six people. But in most cases, most ISPs just need one person who's going to be responsible for this and take ownership of it. It doesn't need to be anything more complicated than that. And so we have a big focus on training, skilling up people, helping them with the tools and the requirements to get there. 
then obviously as part of this function we're collaborating with all of the other stakeholders, so SABRIC and the banking sector, the, the cybersecurity hub which is the interface with government and coordination between all of the sectors and we're looking to increase the collaboration between our ISPs in South Africa on issues of cybersecurity. So sharing threat data, notices of detected um, attacks or malware, um, distributing this information to the ISP so that they know that stuff is happening on their networks and are able to deal with it. And so one of the activities that we've started testing out is the idea of running honeypots. Um, we've got a lot of people who run infrastructure, firewalls, IP addresses that might not be allocated to customers yet, all of these kinds of things, and to collect that data together and feed it into some location where we can do useful analysis would help us be able to understand the risks and the issues that we have in our, in, in our environment. So is anybody here running any kind of infrastructure to track what attacks the network, what attacks your firewalls, what is doing strange things on your network. Is anybody doing that? Sorry? What already qualifies infrastructure? Dedicated honeypots and network connectors? A network connector, sure. A dedicated honeypots is probably beyond what the majority of people have implemented right now, but a network connector and being able to see at least when something looks out of place even just a monitoring system, and we're talking later about NMSs, being able to see when your traffic suddenly doubles or your traffic suddenly goes to flatline and you need to know why that happened. Having a monitoring system that just alerts you when you, your links max out might be enough to get an initial sense of when things are going wrong in your network. I had an incident at SADB the other day where one of the random links into the systems infrastructure suddenly went to 100% and this was strange because they normally only use 5 minutes of traffic and the easy answer there was that someone had redeployed a new server and forgotten to lock the firewall down and there was a DDoS coming out of that server. Now in some environments I've seen DDoSs like that carry on for weeks. We caught it within two hours and without proper monitoring and without systems in place to look at these things, these things continue to be a, ri a risk to the rest of the industry. We also have the iCode, which has been around for a long time, but also never really been able to be oper operationalized because we don't have the data to feed into it. So the iCode is something that came out of Australia. Um, where the government mandated ISPs to notify their customers when they had infections on their computers. And the way that that ended up working out is that various people ran honeypots, detected malicious things happening in certain fingerprinting and all the rest of it, and notices were sent to all of the ISPs notifying them that this particular virus infection or that particular virus infection is coming from this IP. And then the ISPs were then responsible for educating those customers to say, you have a problem on your network, here's a list of the four IT shops that you can take your PC to to get virus scanned, to get cleaned up, or to get reinstalled or whatever. And getting rid of the virus infection that were on people's computers that were causing the risk to the Australian internet. Now, we've got the system, we, we've got the, the concept in place here, but we have no data to feed into that to say, these are the compromises, these are the computers that are affected. So we now need to try and get there to be able to tell consumers, your computer is infected, you are creating a DDoS, you are creating this or you're creating that, and get rid of this bad traffic. As I was mentioning earlier, the takedown system, um, don't look at the graphs on the right, they're old, um, but 608 takedown notices in 2018. A fairly large number of them weren't able to be acted on because people lodge takedown notices for stuff that's posted outside of South Africa, which we can't do anything about. 
But there's also a lot of stuff that's sometimes already taken down by the time that the take up notice arrives. And then there's some numbers on, again, the graphs are wrong, but numbers on the left hand side on 94% of takedown notices issued, the ISPs immediately acted and removed the content. I think that that's a fairly good statistic. Online safety education, so obviously, I mean, we were speaking earlier about this educating consumers about speed. We generally need to educate the consumers of our services about almost everything. And so online safety is something that we've been doing as well. Uh, we've got some posters, and I think you can still order free posters from there if you want. I know that there were a number that were distributed to schools and police stations and various other places. If you have some kind of entity that might be interested in those kind of posters, you can order them. And the... Please, will you restart Windows to update? Remind me later. <laughs> yeah. 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 And the raw, the raw image files are available if you've got access to a printer and you can also print the posters yourself. Hi, um, Robert from Work Online and also from Durban. Um, <laughs> um, I had an issue a while ago where uh, email got spoofed, uh, details in the, the content of the email were changed, bank account details, accounting paid to the wrong account, one story. But after that, we tried to go to the police to you know, lodge a complaint and say, you know, fraudulent activity has happened. And the police in Durban, unfortunately, couldn't help. The ISP was very helpful in tracking the email and uh, finding out where it went to, who got the email. But the police, unfortunately, wasn't able to help in any way. They said, well, the guy paid the wrong account, you know, so the story, end the story. Um, what do you suggest in a case like that? So we've got all the details from the ISP, we've got the, the mail trail, we've got IP addresses, everything. But the bank won't do anything because the police needs to give us some paperwork. The police won't give us paperwork because the guy paid into the wrong account. What do you suggest in case like that when the police just don't know what they're doing? So it is a fairly common trend that we've seen that unfortunately your local police station, which is your, in, in, in an ideal world, your local police station is where all of this should start. And unfortunately, the skills at your local police station often are just simply insufficient to deal with these issues because they just, from a technical and from a from an understanding point of view, fall beyond the understanding of of the police staff that at your local police station. Now, the SAPS has a number of or yeah a number of specialised units that deal with specifically cyber and financial activities and commercial crimes and various things like that. Some of them are only interested in the very large crimes, but they do have mechanisms within the police service to get someone with the right skills to then push it to where it needs to go to within one of the specialized units. So what I would suggest, I think you're an ESPA member, ESPA's got connections with those specific people and with some of those, those units. If you're having trouble with your local police station, come speak to us and we can put you in touch with more appropriately skilled people at the police service. Um, ISPA is involved in direct training of the police, so we're obviously starting with these specialized units, we're giving them training on what the internet is, how an IP address works, what an IP address is, what a domain name is, all of these things that are fairly second nature to ourselves, but for a policeman who's come through the training that they've done, don't understand. So we are doing training with them, but it's starting at those specialized units and it hasn't worked its way down to the, the, the individual police stations yet. Hi, Donald Jolly from uh, Mitzel, wearing Mitzel cap. Um, if uh, uh, an ISP receives uh, one of these emails from um, law enforcement or SARS or whatever the case is, just directly sent to the abuse or info or whatever the case is, 
Are they obliged to act on them uh, straight away, or do they then have, can they must, like, let's take the SARS, for example, do they have to wait, or can they wait, should they wait, for something like a subpoena, or whatever the case is, in order to reveal information, like, um, in, basically, end user information? So, so in the case of SARS specifically, um, SARS currently seems to believe that they have certain powers to investigate that might overreach what the letter of the law says. So in the case of SARS, I would be careful, get, potentially get legal advice before revealing information. But I think the important thing in all of these cases is when you find out about these things, when you first receive that notice, Make sure you go and do that investigation, collect all of that information immediately, because a lot of this information in most networks is very ephemeral. It, it disappears quickly. A radius log might get overwritten in 24 hours, or a net flow, piece of net flow data might disappear. Or, so collect the information, make sure that it's securely stored immediately when you receive those. Normally wait for some kind of separate verification. So don't just trust the email that comes in. Um, in some cases they'll offer to fax you something, in some cases they'll offer to send a policeman to your door or whatever. So it's, it is prudent to, to do some level of verification because obviously email can be spoofed. We have seen situations where people have pretended to be representatives of some kind of legal law enforcement entity to try and extract information that they're not really entitled to. But certainly make sure that you collect that information and secure the, the evidence as quickly as possible because we know that it, it disappears. And this is something that we've been explaining to SAPS quite often that going to an ISP two months after something happened and saying, what happened on that day? is not really realistic. But they can send us, in some, and, and we've been encouraging them, although I don't know how much they do this, to even send an informal notice saying, we're going to come back with a subpoena later. This is the information we're going to ask for. Please keep this information for us. And then going through the formal process with the judge and the subpoena and all the rest of that, because those things take time. And then having that information secured for when they come knocking for that. Um, I mean, Ed from Connect Direct or many other hats available as well. Um, while we were in what's it, uh, Korea for the Apricot, which is their sort of big regional internet conference, um, the, the ethnic people like previewed a very nice centralized system of honeypots that each of, uh, well not each, but uh, a multitude of their people, the region like collected data from and sort of like centrally stored. Um, is that something that um, ISPA would be looking at doing. Um, I have discussed with some other people who are trying to get that rolling, but it sounds like you guys might have the, a, a better willpower to get that rolling. Um, I did send you the link, so you can look at that later, but it's a, a very nice centralized thing, giving you anything from the, the standard password to the scanning for to what's being attacked the most, um, and it, because it's quite widely distributed, um, I think they said something like 10% of their members had a, at least one node on their network. It, it got very, very useful information. Um, that get stuck and do an elastic stack or something. Is that something you guys have got to do? So, so that, that is actually exactly what the, the reporting and the notification function of the C-cert is intended to do. Um, certain C-certs choose to run big operation centers with people sitting behind desks and watching graphs and things like that. That's not the intention of this, but the intention for ISPA is to provide a platform for information sharing between the ISPs. So part of our discussions with the banking sector is about the banks taking that exact information about incidents that they are seeing on their infrastructure and sharing them with the ISPs and the ISPs can address the sources of those incidents. Um, in terms of information from ISP honeypots, yes, that's definitely other information that we want to include in this. We are busy working with a number of international organizations who also run honeypot networks and collect this information. In general, they're very hesitant to share this with organizations that don't have a mandate over that data. So very often they'll share it with the owner of an ASN because you have authority over that IP space. 
But getting all of the information for the entire of South Africa is difficult unless we get a mandate from the South African government to get that information. So where we can get information via other channels that will feed, feed into that knowledge about security on the networks that we can then redistribute to the ISPs based on their IP addresses, that's certainly very useful and part of our plan. Uh, my name is uh, Lufo Gray. I'm from East London. I represent an organization called the Internet of Things Forum in Buffalo City, East London. Um, my question is based on a company that I run, which is deploying fiber optic infrastructure in East London, and focusing on East London, in fact. So uh, I, I, got a, I recently got an email from an American company saying that I must cease and desist from using their name, whereas I own the trademark in South Africa. Mm -hmm. So. They also say I must stop using the domain name online, so I must take it off. So, in terms of ISPA, do you play? Are you able to play an intermediary role in, in such cases? ISPA doesn't generally become an intermediate intermediary directly in that. Um, we can direct you towards legal resources, so legal consultants or legal people who will be able to answer those questions correctly. In general, my sense is that many of those notices are fairly empty threats because they have no legal basis in South Africa. In order for it to have a legal basis in South Africa, it has to be based on South African law. And so there, there's a lot of, particularly Americans, who will send out all kinds of notices telling you all kinds of things about how bad you are. And they look very scary, but unfortunately they have no legal standing. Um, I wouldn't ignore it completely. It's worth having a discussion with someone who has a legal background. I, I know that we've got Calvin here who has some understanding about domain names. Put it behind Calvin. Who can who you can talk to about issues around domain names. And yes, have a discussion with someone who's more experienced in these things and yeah, take it from them. Madly from Afrique. You mentioned that uh, some ISPs can actually get subpoenas uh, mailed to the abuse email addresses. And I'm assuming that that information is being uh, queried from the Afrinic hoist. The reality out there is a lot of our members who have resources do not have an abuse email addresses. Even though there is a policy which, is, which, say, which doesn't make it mandatory, uh, at the moment, uh, it's optional. Uh, we have the, we have everything in place to ensure that members can have an abuse, an IRT object, and put in the abuse email address in there, and then we put it in the records uh, of the resources. But the uptake hasn't uh, happened. Right. So is there something that we could work with the ISPA uh, or AMIA, anybody interested uh, in getting their abuse contacts updated and be put on the police that can assist with that? But is there room for collaboration to get the update up? Because there's also an, another policy under discussion that may indeed make it mandatory. So, so certainly from the law enforcement side, from the feedback we've been getting when interacting with them is that the Afrinic database is pretty much the source of all of the information. Um, so that's why if there's no abuse contact registered, sometimes the policeman will just rock up at someone who registers the person object. And that's, that can be scary. So the, part of the capacity building that we have around abuse tests and around handling of these issues is around understanding what is needed, training people, encouraging people to update their ethnic information so that it's useful for law enforcement, so that law enforcement doesn't go chasing after the wife of the owner or the who, whoever else might appear in the US and goes directly to a, a valid abuse contact or a valid security related contact in order to get these things resolved quickly. Law enforcement has raised with us a number of times how poor some of the data is that they get out of the US. They, some of the IPs they look up and they can see the organization and they automatically know it's a big ISP, they have a relationship, then it's easy. But many of the small ISPs, they do battle with the information. And what is starting to happen is when law enforcement will come to ISPA asking us to unravel who 
the contact person is behind the particular affirmative at this point. And work online. Um, so this is less direct to Graham and more direct to Madhu. Um, <laughs> so you and I have had this conversation a couple of times. I know, I know that it's not a problem that's necessarily yours to solve personally, but one of my one of the, one of the sources of, of the most frustration that I've got with Africa is around is around tooling in general um, and tooling and the ability to automate things and the. The worst example of that for me is the fact that with other than going through my Afrinic, it is virtually impossible to update things like abuse handles on your ordnance. And without the ability to manage that kind of information, people are just going to let it get stale. You know, we've had this conversation in the context of routing information, but it's just as valid in the context of contact information. And it's not a policy question. This does not have to get fixed through the, R through the RPD. Afrinic can just take the bull by its horns and fix the problem and make it easier for its members. You know, there's a lot that you guys can be doing on this. I think we can have a discussion yeah. after this. I'll take all the details and then we'll I'll push it to the team yeah. to see how we can. Thank you very much, everybody. Anybody else got questions before we wrap up? If you have questions, you'll have to ask at lunch because of the, you can smell the food and yeah. yeah. There's some contact details there if you need to get all of me. And